Hi everyone, and welcome back to another episode right here at Catholic Table Talk Podcast. This is the podcast where everything Catholic is on the table once again for episode 113. Thank you again for sticking with us through this whole time. It's really been a joy, and it's been a pleasure to join with you through 113 episodes. Um, today we have a first-time guest on the show, uh, Kimberly Begg. Um, she's a Catholic author of, of, of the book, I will soon show you. Um, so we're going to talk about unbreakable saints who inspire saints and moral courage. So very, very cool topic. Um, before we get to that, though, again, real quickly, thank you again, like I said, for just joining with us through 114 episodes. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and share the show on all four platforms. If you don't know which platform we are on, please look down in the description box below and see all of our um, platform links down there. And uh, yeah, this is the easy way to get a hold of us is catholicTT at gmail.com. Again, it's catholicTT at gmail.com. It's an easy way to get a hold of us and for a speaker and show topic requests as well. Also for donations and only motion days. Also, today's episode is brought to us by Dr. Katrina Wynn. Dr. Katrina Wynn is a Catholic doctor and um, physician. See how she can help you, your family, and your community out at mdkatrina.com. Also, she can be found at mycatholicdoctor.com. On to this week's show now. We're going to delay long enough. Um, so, a little about Kimberly here. Uh, Kimberly Bay is a Catholic wife and mother of five children who is trying to cooperate, cooperate with God's grace to guide her family to heaven. And a toy with more than 20 years experience a uh, strengthening Catholic and Catholic cases. She's helped uh, found Young Americans Foundation, Standing Up for Faith and Freedom Seminar, and a program for students at Catholic schools. While serving as the Foundation's Vice President and General Counsel, she serves on the board of, of overseers of the New American House of Studies the Board of Directors of Young Americans Foundation, the Board of Advisors of the Clara Booth uh, Lawrence Center for Conservative Women, and the D.C. Board of Re Regrets of Thomas Aquinas College. She is Director of Programs and General Counsel on the Arcturian Family Foundation and editor of Catholic School Playbook, an online resource for renewal of Catholic education her study, study guide is available for unbreakable at her website. And again, I'll, I'll just show you the book right here. Um, you see it, Unbreakable, the Saints who inspire, who inspire the Saints to, to more forge. So um, let's welcome in Kimberly Bank for the first time on at the table. So Kimberly, thank you again for coming on the show today. Thanks for having me on. Awesome, man. Uh, like I said, I always, I always like the uh, guest more than what's just because there's, I mean, just like everyone else, we're so busy and you know, we in the bureau, I see you're so busy on all these boards and everything. So it's a pleasure to have you on today. Thank so, you. Happy to be here. Yeah. So like I said, I got the book in the mail and it looks great. And my mom's like, wow, that's so cool. I will read that. I'm like, we got to read it together. And so, yeah. Um. So we kind of go right from the top here, Kimberly. Um, like, why did you write the book? Was there an inspiration behind it? Um, was it just kind of something that you thought about for a while and finally kind of had the time to do it? Or just tell us a well, little bit about it. You know, we live in a world today where there's a lot of confusion, where right. even a lot of Catholics don't know who they are and why they were made. And because of that, we are seeing a lot of Catholics trying to get away around the cross. Right. But this idea that our path to heaven can ever be free of suffering and sacrifice has no grounding in sacred scripture or in the sacred traditions of the church. And one of the greatest traditions of the church, um, what she has passed on to us through the ages, are the stories of the saints. A few years ago, I was honored to give a presentation to Young America's Foundation Standing Up for Freedom seminar, and I spoke about one of my favorite saints, Yerji Papiushko, blessed Yerji Papiushko. He was the very courageous chaplain of the Solidarity Movement, and he helped 
just millions of people in Poland and throughout the Eastern Bloc see the, the evil, see through the lies of the communist state. And he gave them hope. He gave them hope in Christ's promises to us because he would hold these masses for the fatherland. And sometimes 20,000 people would show up and his friends would rebroadcast his homilies on Radio Free Europe, which was broadcast throughout Poland and throughout the Eastern Bloc. And they would record his words and reprint them in underground newspapers. And in doing that presentation, in my research, I discovered that his favorite saint as a child, whom he learned about for the first time at his grandmother's house, because he read her copies of Knights of the Immaculata, was Saint Maximilian Kolbe. And when you look at this courageous man, and you think, you know, what was it who gave him the courage to stand up when he knew that the communists were not happy with his truth telling when he'd been harassed for years, um, when he was the victim of just terrible ca character assassination by the communists, just terrible accusations. They planted evidence in his apartment. You know, what made him keep going day after day, year after year, preaching the truth of the gospels to the people when the communist government only wanted atheism, when they were trying to stamp out Catholicism in the country? Well, it makes perfect sense when you realize that every single day he was praying to and thinking about and being inspired by St. Maximilian Kolbe. And that was really the inspiration for the book. And from there, I uh, started looking at other saints and the saints who inspired them. And um, I was really honored that Tan Books took me on as a first time author. Uh, there are four saints in the book. Um, and then th there are four main saints in the book. And then there are uh, 10 saints in those chapters, um, the saints who inspired them. Really, that's, that's very cool. Um, and yeah, one thing, I think like a couple of things you talked about was you know the Catholics kind of going um, around the cross you know you know think we should suffer or whatever just kind of trying to take the easy road through Catholicism but there's not an easy road through Catholicism um, and that really I mean that in itself through I mean throughout history countries have been trying to step out Catholicism and it, but some are um, some are, some do it some don't. Um, but I think the biggest thing is it's just the weakness in the church that so many Catholics, like you said, um, just try to take the easy route along the cross. And um, can you, is the saint, is he a saint or is he blessed? He's a blessed. Blessed. Okay, thank you. Never, never heard of him before. So very, very cool. So I, I actually, he's been a, a hero of mine for a number of years because I okay. have a, a dear friend who had visited his grave site just a few years after the fall of the Berlin Wall. So sure. Soviet communism was defeated. And um, a good friend of mine, he was a staunch anti-communist. He uh, was a longtime president of Young America's Foundation. So we worked together for a number of years. And he had visited a lot of the uh, most important sites to Catholics throughout Europe. And he said that visiting Blessed Yerji Papayuska's gravesite, and at that point, he was not a blessed. He was just Father Yerji. But he said that visiting that gravesite, he had the most profound spiritual experience of his life. And that really got my attention. So it was just a few years ago um, that his cause was open, and he's now blessed. Um, but, uh, you know, he may be unfamiliar to us, but the Polish people, they know all about Father Yerji. And what's neat is there are still so many people who have personal memories of him, uh, who were inspired themselves. And we've had the opportunity to get to see, you know, video footage of, of people being interviewed about him. And it's amazing because he developed a habit of living courageously for Christ throughout his life. And we've actually had the opportunity to, you know, speak to some of the people who right. witnessed his life along the way. Whereas some of the, the saints who are older, we, we don't have that same experience, but he is a modern day saint. And um, one of the experiences in his life that struck me the most is when he was 18 years old, he had to do his two year compulsory military experience for the communists. So for two years, he was treated horribly that the seminary students um, were treated specifically badly. They were given unholy temptations and they were uh, threatened and just given this horrible conditions to live in. And they were not allowed to pray. So prayer was strictly prohibited, but Yerji never let that stop him. 
So he used to pray the rosary out loud. And this had a real just impact on the other, the other uh, um, seminary students and priests who were so serving their compulsory military service alongside them. So it had an evangelical effect to them and it helped strengthen them. But as, import, as important as that is, he was able to develop this habit of courage. So later in his life, he was able to look back on this and know that for two years, um, he was able to continue to pray when the communists told him he couldn't. And by the way, he was just um, uh, tortured because of it. He was made to stand outside in the rain, treated horribly. They even once put him in solitary confinement for a month. Um, he actually spent the last year of his military service in and out of the hospital um, because he was treated so poorly. But he had all those memories to draw from. And I think it's really important that as Catholics, we create some of these memories now because we don't know what our path is going to be and what challenges God has in store for us. Exactly right. It's a good, good way to end on that question for sure. And I mean, yeah, like, like you hit on the head too, that we don't really know him, but he's a modern-day Satan. Satan, of course, people still remember them, and that's great. Um, and, you know, lots of Polish kids have a great, um, you know, guy I look up to um, who was just modern-day. So that's really, very, very cool. So moving on, you know, just there's so many Satan books out there um just i remember from when growing up in my home homeschooled and we had so many books on the states and we wrote so many states and uh now i mean granted those are kind of books for little kids more but there's so many books on the states so i know you said they have four states in this book what makes this book different from the rest of them okay well you're right there are amazing works already out there and we own a lot of them and we've read them to our children and our, our children have read them but what makes this book unique is that it tells the stories of a saint in a way that's never been done before um and in a way that is more complete because it tells the stories of some of the church's most courageous saints and their favorite saints the saints who inspired them the saints who interceded for them throughout their lives and then it also documents some of those moments in their lives that helped them develop a habit for living courageously for Christ in the world. Awesome. Yeah, well said. Um, that's great. I mean, yeah, well, I'll leave it at that. So, well, very, very cool stuff. Um, so, how did you choose the saints in the book? Was there something that, I mean, again, was there something that you inspired from them? Um, was it something that you said, hey, I don't really, let's pick up four sites I really know about. Um, was, um, did you help, did you have any help writing the book or did someone say, hey, you should check this site out? Um, just how did you pick them? Yeah, that's a great question. So, you know, knowing that Blessed Yerji Papiushko was going to be in there, I started just, you know, looking at the books that we have around the house and, and trying to figure out, you know, some of my favorite saints, who those saints sure. might have might have inspired them. And I came up with a list of about 12 saints and then the saints who inspired them. And then really, and this might be bold to say, but I feel like it was the saints who came to me, not the other way around. And so I wrote the chapter on Father Yerji first, and I went right to St. Jose Luis San uh, Sanchez del Rio. And then I went to Mother Teresa, St. Teresa of Calcutta. And then I finished with St. Joan of Arc, who is actually the first saint in the book, the first chapter. And actually, you know, that whole journey, I think just, just came about so beautifully because it makes sense to start the book with St. Joan of Arc, even though she was the last chapter I, I wrote, because her story involves St. Michael the Archangel, because St. Michael appeared to her, inspired her, interceded for her, helped her on her just impossible journey, impossible seeming journey that she was on. But his story, of course, involves the first battle of good and evil. So it, I think, really sets the tone for the rest of the book, because we see a lot of evil um, in the rest of the book, but we also see the triumph of good. And, and I mean, basically, that's just life. That's that's the world. You see a lot of evil in the world, but the but the good trial trial it's over. And, and and that's so, okay. And and we shouldn't yeah. be and we shouldn't be afraid of it. Why? We shouldn't be afraid of suffering and sacrifice. You know, time and time again, looking at the lives of these saints, 
um, people describe them as, as having just a wonderful calm and inner peace, because even when we're suffering, even when life gets really, really hard for us, you know, even when we're targeted specifically for our faith, we can have joy. We can have joy moment to moment. And these saints really show that. And hopefully it can help some of us as we're going out in the world, we shouldn't be afraid. You know, uh, we shouldn't be afraid of suffering. A lot of us are really tempted to keep our heads down and to not let other people know that we're Christians because in the world today, Christians are considered haters. Um, we are we are really hated for our faith. And you know, some of that is is coming from a very evil source. We know that. But some of it is really just, you know, a lot of misunderstanding of people. And of course, we never want to be misunderstood. So we think, and I think some of us justify it as, well, they don't understand my faith. So I'm not even gonna let them know about it, you know. But I, I think that's really the wrong approach because if all of us who are faithful Catholics lived our faith joyfully and courageously, you know, first of all, we would find we would find each other out in the world because if we all keeping our heads down, we can't connect with each other and we can't encourage each other. So we would find each other, but we would also start planting those seeds um, in you know other people's minds because the truth really is written on our hearts. And when we hear truth, um, it, it speaks to us. And that goes for the most hardened atheists, that goes for agnostics, that goes for fallen away Catholics. And we don't know what kind of a journey somebody else is on. And it's very possible that we are being put in the path of somebody else who's on their path back to Christ. So we really need to take that responsibility seriously. Right. And I, you know, to be honest, Kimberly, I mean, I've seen that just with, you know, the show, the podcast, a lot of non-Catholic Protestants follow the show and they, and they enjoy it. They only argue to the degree of where we get really arguing with each other, we don't respect one another. Um, and the, but they find it really interesting, really intriguing that you know I'm practicing the faith, I'm having the show and everything. I'm having people like you on the show talking about the Catholic faith and the saints and everything. And we really find that very, very awesome. So yeah, you're not really trying to set be on the up on the bar and uh, just be quiet and like. Saint Teresa of Calcutta, like you mentioned, I mean, she just reading her quotes on social media every so often, or just seeing um other of uh, words that she's spoken. I mean, I draw a lot of inspiration from that as well. And I don't think it's a bold statement when you said like came to me because I mean, that's not. I don't think that's a bold statement because I'm sure I I'm sure it's probably true. Um, you know, saints are interesting for us, and I think that's I think that's cool, and I, and I think that's true that they did come here. So, yeah, awesome. you know, you know um, I, a memory just as we're chatting, a memory just sure. occurred to me, and it's something I haven't thought about in a while, but um, I want to share it with you. I, cool. I, I used to be, I used to be a runner. And um, I would run with, you know, whoever would want to run with me. And a lot of times it was, you know, non-Catholics, people who did not share my faith, did not share my worldview, but they were, you know, kind and pleasant to run with. Well, I went running with this young woman. She's a teacher um, in the local government schools. Lovely, right? Just very, very lovely. And I had completely forgotten about this conversation that we had. But apparently years ago, um, marriage came up. And I started telling her about the Catholic understanding of marriage and of procreation um, as the product of a sacramental marriage. And the reason that we don't uh, use contraception within a marriage is because we we understand um, the marriage act um, to be unitive and pro procreative. And um, we think it's important to honor God's will and to be open to life, you know, every single time um, we uh, have engage in the sexual act with our spouses. And I remember her being just fascinated by this. Um, I, I went to California to do an event with the Young America's Foundation, and the speaker who was there, we were sort of chatting, and he said, I want to send you a book. And he ended up sending me a, a bunch of books, and um, I got back to my office, and I know she and I had just had this conversation, and I just texted her and said, you know, can I send you this book? Um, I had completely forgotten about this. This was years ago. Just a few months ago, I got a random Facebook message from her, and she said, look, I just want to tell you you sent me that book and I'd completely forgotten that I had done this. She said it really changed the way that I approached my life, totally changed my perspective. Um, and she's a practicing Christian now. And it just gives really? me chills to think about it. 
um, because I was so busy at the time, right? So I, I had this job and I was traveling a lot and I had five kids at home. Life was very, very busy. But the fact that, you know, something in my heart compelled me to take the time to reach out to her and she wasn't a close friend and to send her this book, you know, when we feel that on our heart, to say something, to be courageous, to do, do something proactively, that's unexpected. You know, that's a prompting from the Holy Spirit a lot of the time. And we really need to pay attention to that. Absolutely. Yeah, you can't ignore it because, uh, yeah, it's knocking on the door and you can't ignore them. So, yeah, absolutely. And, and I think that kind of leads us to the next question, too. I mean, like, like we always say, like, you know, obviously a priest saying, you know, just plot the seed, like, you know, you did in that case. And then God takes care of the West. Like, you know, she's like, wow, is that so great? That's practicing Christian now. Um, so what is the biggest challenge that Catholic parents face today? Um, I mean, I think a lot of it, just what, I don't know where you're going with this exactly, but in my opinion, it's just a lot of like public schools, um, Catholic parents have a lot of problems in public school of, of what the training being taught. Um, and the worry about the train coming back and kind of falling away from the faith, um, as well as just kind of not having the, uh, and I talked about this in my last episode a little bit too, um, just not really having the best Catholic faith and being the great um, parents, the role models that they should be, that um, Christ is calling us to be, or calling them to be. So what is the biggest challenge that they face and what should or shouldn't it should 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 they be doing? Well, I think the biggest problem that they face is they don't really understand that you know, our salvation is intimately tied to our children's salvation, and our number one goal for our children is to help them along their path to heaven. So, a, a lot of parents say today that um, what they want more than anything for their children is to be happy. Um, and probably a, a number two, most uh, what they want most for their children is to help them achieve uh, personal success. So they want them to go to a good college. They want them to get a good job. You know, all of that is good and fine. Um, but the most important goal has to be getting them to heaven. You mentioned the public schools. I think no question. And it, it's actually been this way for decades, um, but it has gotten to such a such a point now that everybody's actually very transparent about what's happening. So the fact that schools are now actively um, and admittedly opposing parents and saying, no, your kids actually belong to the community and we have right and good on our side. And therefore we don't care if you oppose our, our teaching and what, our worldview is. So if a parent is sending their kid to a government school, they have to assume that they're going to be taught a secular worldview. And they have to assume that the, the teachers there are not going to respect the fact that you are bringing them up with a Christian and a Catholic worldview at home. I think the public schools are very, very dangerous. Um, I also think that parents have a lot of options today. So um, Anthony Esselin said something years ago that I, I, I repeat this wisdom to people all the time because he said that people will come to him and say, look, homeschooling is great and all, but I have no idea what the curriculum should look like. I've never taught before, you know, so what am I supposed to do, you know? And his advice is, look, if your kid is getting poison every day, the number one most important thing is to stop the poison. So if you just take them out of the school and you stop the indoctrination that's happening in those schools, your kid is going to be better off. But of course, that's not all that is going to happen. Literature is probably the most important thing that we can pass on. Good, classic, wholesome literature that helps children you know, understand the human experience through the perspective of some of the greatest writers of our time. So even just giving your kids a few books to read um, over the course of a year, they will probably be getting a better education than they did in the public schools. You know, a lot of parents um, are, 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 are dual income families where the husband and the wife work, or maybe it's a single mom and she has to work. And those are challenges, but there are creative solutions to those. One is downsizing, uh, driving a very used car. Our minivan has almost 200,000 miles on it. Um, my husband and I both work because we pay private tuition for our kids, another 
uh, choice for us would be homeschooling, but we have fantastic Catholic schools here and we just love the Catholic schools that our kids are at. And so we're very happy to be a part of those communities and to support them. But remote, remote work has exploded in recent years, especially after COVID. If you're creative enough, there's a way around it. Um, there's really no reason for Catholics to be sending their kids to the public schools right now. Um, and the other thing is there's no reason for Catholics to be giving their kids smartphones. So the digital spaces are just saturated with sexual content, transgender content, lots of dangerous ideologies, lots of talk of suicide, by the way. So surveys have been done and um, something like, I don't know what, I think it's 30% of girls who are on Instagram and Snapchat and um, TikTok regularly hear messages of suicide daily, you know? So if you wouldn't let somebody with these messages into your home, why are you giving them access to your kids on almost a constant basis, 24 seven in their pocket, in their bedrooms, wherever they go. So, you know, my kids have gab phones. So we have five children, we have three teenagers. They're involved in a lot of activities. Their schools are kind of far away and it is convenient for us to be able to stay in touch with them. So they have dumb phones. They have phones with texting capabilities and call capabilities and that's it. And um, that option is available to all parents. Right, absolutely. And that's, yeah, that's a smart way. I mean, so many kids nowadays are uh, instead of reading the Bible or catechism or the uh, books of saints, they're on the phone scrolling through Instagram, Facebook, wherever it might be. Um, so yeah, and, yes. Yeah, the, the other thing I should say um, is keeping, you know, great books in your house, you know, right. I'm a big believer in physical books, you know, because there's just nothing like taking a book off the shelf and opening it up. So if you have a lot of books of biographies of the saints and just lots of good literature, also having the catechism. So we have several copies of the catechism. I am always amazed by the richness in the catechism. Every time I open it, in fact, writing this book, a, a lot of the time I had the catechism right next to me because I would just have a thought and I would, I would just want to hear, you know, right from the church, um, what the teaching was. And it really is beautiful because there are references, scripture and encyclicals, and it's all right there in one place. Absolutely. And I love listening to Father Mike uh, Schmidt's catechism in the year. And so much, I'm not, I'm not really a big reader, I should say. So it's just going and following along with that. It makes it so much easier as well. So if your mm -hmm. kid is uh, more into the audio books, that, and that really helps me anyway, for sure, too. And, uh, yeah, so basically go support your Catholic bookstore. I'll get some book for your kids. Uh, look up Catholic books online. There's a plenty of uh, Catholic online schools online, like I went, um, my family and I went through when we were in school. So, yeah, it's lots of options besides um, public school. So real quickly, Kimberly, in only a couple minutes we have left here today, um, is there a, a section, I mean, excuse me, is there a chapter in the book that really stands out that, um, or like a page that really, that you just love and you really want the audience members to know um, before they read it? You know what? That's a great question. Um, I will maybe cite uh, two sections. Okay. One, um, in the conclusion, I share a list of 10 things that all Catholics can be doing in their daily lives to start help them develop a practice of courage um, in the world, right? So, and these are things that are really important for parents to model to their children so their kids see them acting courageously for Christ in the world. And also young adults, because they're gonna have to start flexing these muscles without their parents in lots of new professional situations and social situations. And it's things like, you know, wearing a crucifix or a miraculous medal. I wear mine all the time. And um, it's funny because I often have, you know, non-Christians ask me because it, it is just very pretty and they will ask me what it is and I have an opportunity to tell them what it is. But things like, you know, saying grace, um, which my family always does when we eat out. But you know what? When we first started doing it, it did feel a little awkward because other people don't do that. You know, anytime you do something that the rest of the society is not doing, it's going to make you feel a little awkward. But the more you do it, the more it just becomes a part of who you are. You know, posting things on social media, commenting, 
supporting others who are truth tellers out in the world. But there, there are many things that we can be doing every day. So that's one thing. The other is that at the back of the book, I share just a list of other resources for parents, you know, other books that have been really important to us. Um, and also just other resources like the Holy Heroes Glory Stories CDs. I'm not sure if you're familiar with these, but my kids have loved these and they have been a really important part of their formation as young people. So, you know, that those stories are one of the ways that they have learned about some of their favorite saints. And, um, you know, another one is Shining Light Dolls. I don't know if you're familiar with these, but um, we have a ton of them in our house and my girls will actually play with them like action figures and they know all the same stories. We have a whole bin of them and uh, they don't have Barbies. And, you know, when I was a kid, I played with Strawberry Shortcake. I love those dolls, but these are like, they're just so beautiful because my daughters know their stories. Um, and they will have them interacting, you know, in character with each other. Um, and they're just like little Catholic action heroes and they're just wonderful. So that's that's just a, sort of an added bonus that um, I haven't had much opportunity to talk about. So I appreciate you asking. Oh, I appreciate you uh, asking that because uh, I always throw a pop-up question in that interview someplace. So oh, I appreciate that. So again, we'll, click, we'll, we'll quickly, um, this is on um, Tam Books. Um, where can people get it and where can they um, get in contact with you? Okay, tanbooks.com, Amazon, and my website, kimberlybeg.com, actually offer signed books on my website. And as a bonus, I'm also offering a free 17 page companion study guide on my website. You can just download it. You don't even have to buy the book to get the website um, or to get the study guide. And it is there to help families with personal reflection and family discussions and homeschool and school curricula, book clubs. But it really helps you concentrate on some of the major themes of the book. Sure. Absolutely, yeah. It looks, like I said, it's very intriguing. It's very, very, very cool. And again, folks, it's unbreakable. Um, the Saints who inspire Saints to more courage by Kim Marie Big. Check it out. Um, love Tam Books. It's one of my favorite publishers. Um, so they, they do great work there. And uh, yeah, so support Kim Marie and support Tam Books. And uh, bring it home and wait till your kids today. So, uh, Kim Marie, thank you again for coming on the show. Really appreciate you having me on. And I uh, hope to have you on again real soon. Excellent. Thank you so much. This is a pleasure. All right. It's Kim Marie Big, everyone. Again, check her out. Kimberlybig.com, find her whole um, website there. All right, that's it for this week. Stay in, stay in grace, stay in the school of the sacraments. Check, uh, read more books out, check hers out. And once again, one more time, it's Unbreakable, um, Saints Who Inspire Saints to Moral Courage. So, and we'll have links down below so for easy access for you as well. Until next time, until next time God bless, God willing. This is Catholic Table Talk, where everything Catholic is on the table.